Hello and welcome to Runkle of the Bailey. My name is Ian Runkle. I'm a Canadian criminal defense and firearms lawyer. Today I want to address an issue that I get asked about a fair bit, and that's what does it take for a container to be a container that cannot be readily broken open or into? This is a phrase that appears at several points in the regulations with respect to transportation or storage. And so it's a phrase that has very important significance for gun owners. Unfortunately, the regulations don't define what that means. So there's no actual legislated standards. This means it's been left up to the courts to figure out what that means. So let's have a look at one case and see how the court in that case looked at it. Now this is the case of the Queen and Cowan. It's a provincial court decision out of Manitoba. So it's not binding on other courts. However, it does go through a lot of the reasoning and I think it would be fairly persuasive in other jurisdictions. But again, they may not follow it. So there's always some uncertainty that's involved. I also like this case because it goes into some detail about the containers that they're referring to, which allows us to then know a little bit more about what they're talking about. So that allows us to better evaluate a case that you might see for sale or maybe one you already own. Now this is a provincial court decision out of Manitoba. It's the case of the Queen in Cowan. Uh, because it's a provincial court decision, it's not binding on other courts. However, this one is very thorough. It's very well reasoned. And so I suspect it's going to be strongly persuasive on other courts. The issues here, there's several issues. I'm just going to focus in on a storage issue with respect to whether his cases were good enough. I'll probably come back to this and do a part two, maybe even a part three, because there's a lot in this case, but I don't want to make this an hour and a half long video. So we see here, the storage of all legally acquired and registered firearms is subject to the requirements set out in the regulations. They actually apply even if you've acquired your firearms illegally, but people who've acquired their firearms illegally tend to be less worried about that. I don't often see a trigger lock on, you know, somebody's handgun that they're toting around while they're dealing drugs, for example. Overarching all storage requirements is the obligation to ensure that storage is not done in a careless manner or without reasonable precautions for the safety of other persons, section 86 of the code. Any loss or theft of a firearm must be reported with reasonable dispatch. That's one of the other issues that I'm just not going to get to in this video, but it is interesting. At issue in this particular case are the types of containers purchased to store restricted firearms and the manner in which firearms were stored in the house. Also at issue is when the requirement to report the loss or theft of a firearm arises. Joey Cowan, Cowan was the owner of eight legally acquired and registered restricted and non-restricted firearms, which he stored in his home. Those firearms were trigger locked and stored separately from any ammunition in storage cases that were padlocked. All of the cases were stored behind Cowan's computer desk downstairs in his home, where there were upwards of six children under the age of 18, as well as a house guest. The only time Cowan checked up on his firearms was when he retrieved them to go to a shooting range. The last time he did this was on March 11, 2015. On June 10, 2015, the authorities in Winnipeg received information that one of Cowan's restricted firearms was found in British Columbia. And if it was found by police in British Columbia, it was almost certainly not found by them in, you know, in good terms. This was likely not, hey, there's a guy at the range and we just decided to check out his guns. This was probably found in the hands of some sort of bad actor. On June 17th, 2015, a search warrant executed on Cowan's home revealed that all eight of his firearms were missing. None of them had been reported lost or stolen. The only thing found was some ammunition and the keys to the cases and trigger locks that had been stored in the combination lock safe. Cowan's position was that he was unaware his firearms were missing. It is undisputed that he was both upset and concerned by their absence. The only items still found in Cowan's home were the keys to the trigger locks and padlocks, as well as the ammunition that was stored in a safe and in a combination lock storage case. Though Cowan was shown this ammunition case unlocked, it is unclear how that came to be and whether that might have occurred during the search. Cowan was charged with both careless storage under Section 86 Sub 1 and failure to report the loss of a firearm under Section 105 1A of the Criminal Code. The Crown proceeded by indictment, which means they view this as very serious. They want a, a heavy punishment. Cowan elected trial in provincial court. The trial was heard over four days. At the close of this case, I requested written legal briefs. If you're wondering how much it costs to have a four-day trial with written legal briefs, it's many, many dollars. So this was an expensive uh, experience for Mr. Cowan. 
I'll also note that this is a very unusual set of circumstances, notwithstanding the sort of arguments you may see on Twitter and so forth. Uh, it's very rare that people have firearms stolen and don't notice them. His circumstances are highly unusual, but uh, that's sort of neither here nor there here. So one of the big issues is going to be the strength of these cases. So we've got the party's position, which is, you know, the Crown's case and the defense case. So the Crown's position is that first, Cowan's choice of storage case did not comply with the legal requirement to have a container that is not readily broken open or into. She also submits that Cowan's choice of storage location, given the circumstances present within his home and the lack of regular monitoring of his firearms, likewise make him guilty of careless storage. So we're going to be focusing in on the container aspect here. But I'll also note that they didn't charge him with storage contrary to regulations, which I find to be very strange under these circumstances, because if you're arguing that his container wasn't one that is not readily broken open or into, wouldn't that make him in violation of the regulations? They're not required to charge that. Certainly they don't have to charge every offense that's potentially available. But usually that one is easier to prove if that's something you're arguing. So I don't know why they didn't charge that. I'm skipping over the failing to report aspects. Again, that'll be for a future video. And I do intend to come back to this case for those reasons. So defense counsel argues that this court should find Cowan not guilty of both charges. He said that Cowan's storage practices not only comply with all legal requirements, they are consistent with the standard practice of many firearms owners. Defense called two witnesses, Mr. Cowan and David Brown, also an expert in the safe and proper storage, handling, and usage of firearms in Canada, but also in the content of the Canadian Restricted Firearms Safety Course. As can be readily gleaned from the foregoing summary, the trial evidence focused on Cowan's firearm storage practices but also, to a greater extent, the legal requirements for firearm storage, which is why we're interested in this. It's why this is a great case to read. Given the nature of the evidence with respect to the firearm storage practices and the fact that Cowan testified, this court needs to assess that evidence in accordance with the principles enunciated in the Queen and WD. This is a case I'll probably do another video on at some point. What this case is about is how the courts should evaluate contradictory evidence. So it's very common that uh, cases are sort of one person says one thing, another person says another thing. Sometimes people describe this as he said, she said cases. But how the court should approach that is really set out in WD and the cases that follow WD. Uh, to make factual determinations as to what exactly those practices were, but more particularly as to what circumstances existed in Cowan's home at the relevant time. The court will then need to assess the competing expert opinions to determine whether or not, based on that evidence, the Crown has proven the offense of careless storage against Mr. Cowan. As will be explained below, I find that the Crown has failed to prove the offenses of careless storage and failure to report beyond a reasonable doubt. So we already know the ending. He's getting acquitted. And I really like when judges do this because often these verdicts are actually read out in court. Sometimes they're just mailed out, but usually when it's a criminal trial, they want to bring the accused there so that this can be read to them. And it's really annoying when they leave the, you know, the ultimate verdict to the end. And sometimes they do that, I think, because they're worried that the accused might freak out if they're convicted. But it can be really agonizing, both for the lawyer, because you're invested in the case, and for the accused who's sitting there waiting to find out what's going on, if the judge is unwilling to tell you why they came to their decision. And sometimes their, their reasons sort of waffle back and forth, making it sound like, oh, maybe I'm going to acquit. Maybe I'm going to convict. It's really not a, a nice thing to do, especially to the accused, who's, you know, it's the most pivotal moment often of their lives. They're sitting there wondering if they've got jail time on the line. That's kind of an aside, but it's a, a personal rant of mine. I wish more judges would put up front and center that what their, uh, their result is. So there's a whole thing about their relationship. I'm not going to go into it too much uh, other than to read this bit. This hectic lifestyle and lack of communication is important in this particular case as it plays a role in the reliability of the Crown's evidence. Indeed, although I had some concerns about the consistency of Mr. Cowan's evidence generally, the Crown's evidence was unreliable or lacking to a point that this court was unable to outright disbelieve all of Cowan's evidence 
or find that the Crown established the facts as required for a finding of guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. So what they're saying here is that the Crown's evidence was shaky and he's going to walk in any event uh, if, the, if they're not able to prove it because the burden of proof is always on the Crown. So this is a list of some of the firearms that was taken. Restricted, Norinco 9mm Luger semi-automatic handgun purchased on the date. Uh, 5.56mm Black Forge semi-automatic rifle. It's unclear whether this is an AR or some other rifle. Uh, 9mm Luger uh, GCOM E semi-automatic handgun. 9mm Luger Ger or Gerson. I'm actually unsure of the pronunciation of that. Please let me know in the comments because that's kind of embarrassing. 44 automatic Ruger semi-automatic handgun. Uh, 357 uh, Magnum Alpha Project revolver and a rifle and shotgun of manufacture caliber and purchase date unknown. The reason why is because they don't have the registration certificates for those, but, uh, and Mr. Cowan probably wasn't too keen on volunteering that information. Mr. Cowan purchased his non-restricted firearms from a well-known hunting and fishing store, hereafter called The Store. All of his restricted firearms were bought and financed through the shooting range he was a member of, Extreme Gun Shooting Center. Each of the restricted firearms was duly registered to his home address. I should note, I have not been paid anything by any company that appears in this. Yeah. <laughs> storage of the firearms. So they go into things. All of the storage cases were what can best be described as carrying cases, meaning that they were of a size and weight that allowed them to be picked up with one hand and carried from one destination to another. Typically, these are something that contains one or two rifles and has a handle, if you're a gun owner, you're probably familiar with these things. If not, you can see them for sale at, you know, Cabela's, Canadian Tire, any gun store. These are ubiquitous. So Plano 10164 Gun Guards uh, SE 4 pistol case, which held the 357 Magnum Alpha Project revolver, the uh, Gerson, the 44 automatic, semi-automatic, the 9mm uh, GICOM E, and the Plano SE Series Single Pistol Accessory Case, which held another 9mm handgun. Plano 108420 Gun Guard AW Tactical Case, which held the 556 Black uh, Semi-Automatic Rifle. Plano Pillared Takedown Gun Case, which held the shotgun. And Safari Double Rifle Case, which held the rifle. Together with ammunition and a variety of gun-related paraphernalia, the sum total of all of Cowan's firearm-related purchases was well over $4,000 which is the kind of collection that uh, the media will describe as an arsenal and which gun owners will describe as, okay, he's, he's got a good start. So it's not a huge collection. It's a fairly small collection because it doesn't take much to get over 4,000 bucks. So he bought all of these gun cases and he says he was of the view that not only did they comply with the storage regulations, but that after making inquiries at the store and researching online, that they were good quality cases that would ensure the safe storage of his firearms. And they have the manufacturer's product description. So for the Plano 10164, this gun guard four pistol case has a rugged look and solid protection for the beginning sportsman. Gun guard SE series cases feel or feature contoured recessed latches, padlock tabs for added security and strong rigid ribbed construction. Case will accommodate up to four long barreled handguns, and they give the dimensions, uh, features, holds up to four long barreled handguns, padlock tabs for added security in airline travel, contoured recessed handle, protective high density foam interior, steel hinge pins for added durability. And the Plano SE series uh, single pistol case, wide recess snap over latches designed for travel, steel hinge pins for maximum durability, high density foam, centered padlock locations, safely secure contents. Plano 108420, uh, designed for the most extreme conditions, is designed to hold an AR-15 style rifle up to 43 inches long. The Gun Guard AWR series is the ultimate shield against the elements, featuring a continuous dry lock seal that ensures the case is watertight, airtight, and dustproof. Its rugged construction is engineered to keep your firearms safe. Product dimensions, and they give the dimensions, Features lockable, weatherproof, hard-sided gun case carries an AR-15 ri or style rifle up to 42 inches long. I don't know why it says 43 in one place and 42 in the other, but that's advertising for you. 
Dual stage spring loaded lockable hatches with padlock tabs, high strength pinned hinges, continuous dry lock seal for weatherproof protection, high density foam interior, thick wall construction, integrated press release valve designed to withstand extreme conditions, lifetime warranty against defects. Plano Pillar Takedown Gun Case. Plano Pro Max Pillar Lock Gun Cases provide the ultimate in firearms protection. These crush resistant gun cases feature the patented pillar lock system which uses molded contact points that meet when the case is closed to form pillars for superior crush resistance. Cases feature thick walled construction, soft foam, and ergonomic molded in handles. Heavy duty latches and padlock tabs keep guns safe and secure in the case. Airline approved. Made in USA. Features pillar lock system for superior crush resistance. Thick wall construction, lockable, airline approved, comfortable ergonomic molded in handle. I know this is a lot to go through, but the nature of the cases is very important here because the whole point of doing this case is to look at what the court is going to consider a securely locked case and what they won't. Safari double lock or double rifle case, impact resistant foam, protective rubber feet, two combination locks and key locks, deluxe carrying handle, approved for airline travel, sleek hard body construction with aluminum trim. Though not readily apparent from the manufacturer's product description, all of the above cases appear to be made from black hard plastic, with the exception of the 108420 Gun Guard AW case that was also framed in silver. And it was uncontradicted that they were stored trigger locked in the storage cases, which were padlocked, and the keys themselves were placed in another safe. And these items were hidden in his home. We'll get to that uh, in a future video. And I'm going to skip past a fair bit here because this is all stuff that's related to the other issues with respect to carelessness and with respect to the reporting issues. But now they've got uh, experts who are being called here. The experts called to testify as to Cowan's storage practices. Uh, Hurley and Brown are both experts in the safe and proper storage, handling, and usage of firearms in Canada. Brown, however, is also an expert in the content of the Canadian Restricted Firearm Safety Course. Both experts agree on the applicable legislative framework for the storage of firearms. Where they differ is with respect to whether the particular cases purchased by Cowan to store his restricted firearms were sufficient, and whether the circumstances present in the home required Cowan to exercise additional caution in his storage practices. So, Corporal Hurley is a member of NWEST, which is the RCMP's sort of firearm investigation group. Uh, he testified that NWEST was created to assist frontline policing and firearms investigations nationally. The problem with NWEST is that they are police officers. They don't necessarily, the views they have are not necessarily the law so much as the RCMP's interpretation of the law, which can be a problem. It is an organization that helps with the drafting of applications for judicial authorizations, providing advice on charging offenses, helping with investigations, examining firearms, as well as liaising with the CFO and other firearms officers from the Canadian Firearm Program. Although he has uh, in-depth knowledge of the Canadian Restricted Firearms Safety Course Manual, he personally has never instructed the course. It was Hurley's opinion that Cowan's, uh, Cowan's storage practices were careless for several reasons. The first is, that he stored his firearms in receptacles that could easily be broken open or into. And the reason for that is that paragraph 84 here, uh, Hurley was also critical of two of the Plano cases uh, Cowan purchased to store his firearms in, the 10164 Gun Guard and the Plano SE series uh, pistol case. Though he thought these two Plano cases were suitable for transportation, it was his opinion they were not suitable for storage at home. Hurley explained that the difference lay in the degree of monitoring or control over the firearm. He explained that during transportation, a firearm is with you at all times. At home, it is not, such that the integrity of the receptacle storing the firearm at home needs to prevent others from accessing or moving it. Now, I'll just stop here to note that the same language is actually used for the transportation and storage. There's no additional language that says that it has to be extra secure for storage. So. I don't know where he's getting this. This seems to be sort of his personal take, and it seems to be him trying to add on to the law a requirement that doesn't actually seem to be found in the text. Hurley testified that he purchased the two Plano cases in issue and tested them to determine whether they could be easily uh, broke or whether they could easily be broken open or into. He found that they could in several manners. 
By pulling the sides apart with his hands, removing the hinge pin with a pair of pliers and prying the case open, stepping on it and cracking the case open, or cutting into the plastic case with a knife. In each instance, the firearm within the case could be extracted with little effort. Given the relative ease uh, with which he could break open and into these Plano cases and extract a firearm, it was Hurley's opinion that they were not suitable cases for storage. He acknowledged, however, that the tests he performed on the two cases were not tests that a person would do at the store. <laughs> the store will be very annoyed if you break out a knife and start trying to hack open the cases that you're thinking of buying. That sort of goes without saying. He also conceded that, to his knowledge, no such prior testing had been done by any organization in Canada, nor had there been any warnings that the two cases were not suitable for storage. In fact, he testified that at present, there is no certification or approval process in Canada with respect to firearm storage cases. Nonetheless, it was his view that firearms owners should exercise a degree of common sense and do some research as to an adequate storage case. You can see here the questions that would have been elicited in cross-examination by uh, Mr. Cowan's defense counsel, and good work to uh, Mr. Cowan's defense counsel. That was good questions to be asking. As for the Plano 108420 gun guard AW tactical case, Hurley testified that this was a far more robust case and he would have great difficulty prying it apart. As such, he opined that this case, as well as the cases in which the non-restricted firearms were stored, would meet the requirements for storage. He was, however, still critical of Cowan's means of storage behind a computer desk and storage unit, given that it was in an open basement with children in the house. And so I'm skipping over this bit because it's uh, related to other aspects. Uh, Hurley was challenged about his opinion given the wording of the regulations in the manual. He agreed that the regulations do not provide any guidance or description as to what is meant by a container that is constructed so that it cannot be readily broken open or into. He also agreed that the regulations do not prescribe different storage requirements if there are children in the home where the firearm is stored. Hurley further acknowledged that the manual is no clear with its use of the phrase easily broken open or into and that figure 52 shown in the manual under the heading lockable carrying slash storage case which appears to depict a storage case similar in appearance to the ones Cowan purchased could lead to confusion and be open to interpretation. Hurley shared that he had brought concerns of this nature to the CFO on several occasions since the incident at Barr. It was his belief that more clarity needed to be provided as to what would constitute an appropriate storage container. He noted that the RCMP used portable cases but made, it, made of thick steel such that they cannot be readily broken into. In Hurley's words, we have brought up those concerns just to have a better product or better information to people that have firearms. But again, none of this that they're talking about here is actually found in the law. This is the RCMP saying, well, we think that this is our standards and that our standards should be treated as law. That's not how the law should work. The RCMP should not be writing law, which is what it seems that they're trying to do. Because, for instance, bringing this up to the CFO to say, hey, CFO, you need to you know, adopt this policy is effectively like they're trying to make law. That's a problem to my view. So David Brown, uh, Brown is a professional firearms instructor and firearms safety specialist and certified master instructor of the Canadian Firearms Safety Course program. He helped design both the Canadian Firearms Safety Course and the Canadian Restricted Firearms Safety Course. He also helped to write the manual and train instructors in those courses. That sounds to me like an excellent expert witness, at least when you start talking about the courses themselves. Brown's opinion is that Cowan stored all of his firearms in compliance with the regulations. He testified that the regulations set out the requirements all firearm owners must comply with in terms of storage, display, handling, and transportation. Brown agreed with Hurley that the regulations do not define a container that is constructed so that it cannot readily be broken open or into. He did, however, indicate that the manual contained both a description of the type of construction a lockable carrying slash storage case should have, and that being a locked container that cannot be easily broken open or into, as well as a diagram of a container, namely figure 52, previously referenced, which he testified would be acceptable for both the transportation and the storage of restricted firearms. Brown testified that the course manual for the Canadian Restricted Firearm Safety Course does not uh, suggest a different manner of storage depending on where the firearm is stored. He added, however, that instructors are told to always encourage students to use higher standards than the minimum legal requirements set out in the regulations, 
but that they would never suggest that a person who used only the minimum legal standards would be irresponsible. As for the Plano cases Cowan stored his restricted firearms in, and which Hurley was critical of, Brown testified that they are very, very commonly used by firearms owners in Canada to both transport and store their firearms in. He added that a very similar make and model of the Plano cases is used during the Canadian Restricted Firearm Safety course, as well as during the practical test needed to pass the course. And I can back this up. These cases are incredibly common. If you go to the gun range, you will see people bringing in hard plastic cases almost all the time. That's the sort of default case you'll see. So this had potentially huge impact because if the court rules that these are not sufficient cases, a lot of people are in the soup. Brown, however, or Brown was, however, candid that the Plano cases were certainly not the best quality cases that are available on the market. Nevertheless, it was his opinion that they complied with the regulations in the sense that they are not easily broken open or into. Brown opined that any case could be broken open or into given enough force or tools. He added that the advice given to instructors teaching the course, should the question arise as to what uh, easily broken open or into means, would be to invite consideration as to whether an eight-year-old child could easily access a handgun inside the case without requiring tools or damage to the case itself. As for Hurley's demonstration in court as to his ability to break open or pry open the Plano cases, Brown pointed out that he was not a technical expert in the security of gun cases, but added that given the measurements of a typical handgun with a trigger lock applied, he felt it would be a little more difficult to remove the firearm from the case by simply splitting it apart with your hands. Brown also confirmed that there is currently no certification process with respect to firearm storage cases. And I'll skip over the uh, where things are stored. Brown was challenged on cross-examination both res with respect to the quality of the storage cases and Cowan storage practices. He acknowledged that even though the regulations do not define the quality of the storage case, except as it regards a ready ability to break it open or into it, the ultimate responsibility lies with a firearm owner to ensure that his or her own storage cases meet that requirement. He conceded that the presence of children should require that a higher standard uh, that provided in the regulations. That said, it was his opinion that hiding firearms under or behind furniture would be considered a suggested additional step in ensuring safety. As well, although firearms owners are taught during the course to share firearm safety to members of the household, he clarified that this point is not elaborated on because every situation is different. Skipping over a lot of stuff on the standard of care, which is something I definitely plan to come back to because it's very important, but I, this is already a half hour long video. It's going to be longer still, but I don't want it to be too, too long. So we've got here, this is from the storage regulations. An individual may store a non-restricted firearm only if, and then we have stored in a container, receptacle, or room that is kept securely locked and that is constructed so that it cannot readily be broken open or into. And storage of restricted firearms, we see rendered inoperable by means of a secure locking device and stored in a container, receptacle, or room that is kept securely locked and that is constructed so that it cannot readily be broken open or into. And I just want to stop because the court is in a moment going to look at the French. So I want to look at the French here as well. So we see here, uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the last little bit is, et qui sont construits de façon qu'on ne peut le forcer facilement. And facilement is the key word there because that means easily. So it can't be broken open easily. Now in Canada, we're a bilingual country. And so most of our laws are written in both English and in French. Unique to Canada, or at least unlike uh, many other countries, we don't have sort of a preferred language. It's actually that both texts are law and that you can use them together as an interpretation aid to figure out what they mean. This can actually be really useful. So when we see the French saying that it can't be broken open easily, that provides us some context to understand what it means when they say that it cannot readily be broken open or into. This is also why it's really helpful. I'm not a great French speaker. I've got a little bit of French, but it can be really useful sometimes. Uh, as is clear from a reading of the regulations, if a firearms owner chooses to store his firearms in a container or receptacle, that container or receptacle must be constructed so that it cannot readily be broken open or into. The phrase readily broken open or into is unfortunately not defined in the regulations. 
The manual is of no further assistance. Though it provides for alternative language to readily, using instead easily, it neither defines what that means, nor does it provide any examples. So we see storage, rendered inoperable by using a secure locking device, see figure 49, and stored in a securely locked container, receptacle, or room that cannot be easily broken open or into. The manual does, however, provide figure 52 entitled Lockable Carrying Storage Case, which Brown testified as uh, being representative, representative of an acceptable storage case. Though Hurley did not dispute this, he found that the particular cases used by Cowan were not of good enough quality. The lack of definition and guidance in either the regulations or the manual, including the lack of any certification process for firearm storage, is problematic as can be seen by the evidence before the court. Two highly qualified experts who deal with firearms disagree as to what constitutes a container or receptacle that cannot readily or easily be broken open or into. For Brown, the test is one of the average eight-year-old. For Hurley, the test is whether he can physically break into the container or receptacle without much difficulty using his hands, feet, or a tool. Now I'm just going to stop here because if we're applying their definition or Mr. Hurley's definition, First of all, we're talking about a fairly strong individual because we're talking about a police officer. They've got physical training, you know, standards, physical training regimes. And in my experience, most police officers don't just sort of stop at the minimum. They make sure to keep themselves in some sort of good shape. It's, uh, in fact, my experience in terms of the physical standards for the RCMP, as well as the EPS and other police forces I've dealt with, is that people take it very seriously. Uh, sometimes I see pictures from other countries of officers who appear like maybe they haven't had much physical exercise since, you know, the day they were brought in. That's not how, that's not my experience with Canadian sort of standards. So we're talking about not just somebody breaking into it, but a very strong somebody using tools. And I'll further note that when we start getting into the realm of tools, there are many tools that will open even very strong containers very quickly. And depending on how, you know, thoroughly we want to go, if we start looking at people, you know, like lockpicking lawyer, go look at some of his videos, they can get into stuff very quickly that maybe you or I would have a lot more trouble with. But if you start looking at things like somebody coming at this with a thermal lance, that'll cut through, you know, very thick steel, like, you know, fairly rapidly. So once we get into the realm of tools, if you've got the right tool, anything breaks open fairly easily. An angle grinder will get through a lot of uh, a lot of material. So back to the case. These particular sections of the regulations do not appear to be judicially considered, nor does there appear to be any case law where the type of storage case was at issue. This is uh, this makes this case very unique, and so it's worth knowing. The term readily was considered in the case of the Queen and L S J, which likely means that this was a youth case. Uh, paragraph 67, where the British Columbia Superior Court considered what readily meant in regards to Section 42E of the Youth Criminal Justice Act, youth case, which provides that a youth court judge may only impose a restitution order where the amount of the loss or damage is readily ascertainable. In referring to the Shorter Oxford English Dictionary, the court accepted the meaning of readily as quickly, without delay, also without difficulty, with ease or facility. I note that the Canadian Oxford Dictionary 2nd edition defines readily as easily, promptly, without difficulty. These definitions are consistent with the manual's use of the word easily instead of readily. I would note that the entire phrase references a container or receptacle that is constructed so that it cannot readily be broken open or into, such that the focus is on the construction itself, of the container receptacle and the ease with which it can be broken open or into. The phrase itself is also preceded by a requirement that the container or receptacle be securely locked such that the container, when securely locked, must be of a construction that does not permit someone to break it open or break into it uh, easily, promptly, or without difficulty. This interpretation is, in my view, consistent with the French version of the phrase construit de façon qu'on ne peut le forcer facilement. And apologies to all my French viewers, because I know my French, it might be better than some, but it's not great. So the court is accepting this and is saying, you know, they're putting a fairly low standard on that. And I think that that's the appropriate thing to do where Parliament didn't decide to put a higher standard on it. 
because, and if we just think of the impact here, if the court decides that suddenly these cases are no good, lots of gun owners, probably lots of people watching this video would be sitting there thinking of their gun cases going, oh man. And especially people who never meant to do anything wrong. They went to, you know, people who went to Canadian Tire or Cabela's or any of these places, you know, places where legitimate stores that don't sell cheap goods and bought cases that they feel are, you know, are sufficient. So that's, uh, they would have been at risk by a bad decision in this case. In my view, while I accept that it appears that most, if not all storage cases for firearms could be broken into given a certain degree of force, I have some concern about introducing the standard of an eight-year-old child when determining whether a storage case can be readily, bro readily or easily broken open or into. This type of standard risks watering down the legislative provisions and being inconsistent with the underlying purpose of the provision, namely public safety. So they don't like the eight-year-old child test. The issue then becomes whether the particular storage cases used by Cowan could be readily or easily broken open or into. Hurley's opinion is that both the Plano 10164 uh, pistol case and the other pistol case are constructed in a manner that they can readily be broken open or into. I'm really getting tired of saying that. I'm sure you're getting tired of hearing it. Hurley's demonstration in court were certainly remarkable, particularly given the speed and ease with which he was able to pry open the cases. It must be remembered, however, that Hurley tested the cases on his own beforehand to determine if and how he could break into them. It is unclear how much time that took him to figure out how and how many other methods he tried before figuring out how to do so. This is wonderful because the court is sort of saying, you brought in a hired specialist to break this open. How is that going to apply to your average thief who might, for instance, you know, be an illiterate method, meth addicted, you know, person with whatever other difficulties. So, you know, there's a difference here and an NWES specialist in terms of breaking into safes might not be the same as, you know, the average and certainly shouldn't be how we determine the standard. It must also be remembered that the, these tests were done without a trigger lock firearm inside. In this regard, I accept Brown's caution with respect to Hurley's demonstrations. It is also problematic that Hurley's opinion was that only these two Plano cases could be readily broken open or into, and not the others. What this means, once again, is that there is a significant degree of discretion as to which case may or may not be readily broken open or into. This discretion leads to uncertainty when deciding which case that may be, especially without a certification process or an ability to conduct tests on the cases prior to purchasing them, and with manufacturer product information which could, at first blush, appear to suggest adequate storage. Both the Plano uh, cases do on inspection appear to be constructed of a much thinner and pliable uh, plastic than the other Plano cases. However, these cases are consistent not only with the diagram shown in the manual, but also with the cases used during the Canadian Restricted Firearm Safety Course and the practical test needed to pass the course. In addition, I accept Brown's evidence that many firearms owners buy the Plano cases at issue. Not only is Brown more likely to gather this information as a result of his line of employment, but his evidence is consistent with the availability of the cases for purchase at a major retailer, such as the store. I don't know why they didn't actually name the store here. They named the gun store, but they're not naming this other store. That's, I kind of just find myself wondering if there's some reason for that, but I don't know, and I'll likely never find out. As a result of the foregoing, I'm unable to find that the use of the two Plano cases in and of themselves constitute careless storage. Now, note that he was charged with careless storage rather than storage contrary to the regulations. But as a starting point, carelessness is set at following the regulations. Now, the standard for carelessness can be pushed higher or lower depending on sort of the unique circumstances involved. So there are circumstances where you might be following the regulations but still careless, or not following the regulations and not careless. But where the court here is saying that they're finding it you know not careless in and of itself just because of the storage that tells us that the court's view here at least the way i interpret this and i think the way another court would interpret this certainly the way i'd argue this in a uh, in a case is that what this means is that the uh, the regulations don't require anything more so that these Plano gun cases or, you know, the gun cases you buy at Canadian Tire or any of these stores, 
seem to, according to this decision, be lawful, which is a question I get a lot. You know, are these cases that I just bought, are they good enough? Are, you know, this case seems to suggest, you know, yes, they do. And again, provincial court decision, but it's really the best one I've been able to find on this issue. It's certainly the only one that gets into the, uh, the intricacies of the construction. And so this is a case I would certainly expect to be cited if there was, you know, an issue with any cases. At any rate, I hope this has provided a little bit of uh, clarification in an area of law that is unfortunately full of all sorts of unclear standards. If it has, uh, please like the video, share it with your friends, subscribe to see further videos. Uh, I, I'm really glad about how this case came down because as the court notes, if, if these things are, you know, are super common and they are, then if the court had decided that this was careless storage, a lot of gun owners would suddenly have been retroactively essentially determined to have been engaging in criminal behavior and people who are trying their best to follow the standards. So that's something I always hate to see. Uh, I'm going to have a link to this case if you want to read the full decision. I'm going to have further videos on this case because there's other real important issues in it. So keep watching for that. Uh, I promise my next one, though, will be something a little shorter because this one is a little longer than I think many people have the attention span for. Want to thank $50 Patreon supporters D, Mo, and George, as well as $30 Patreon supporter Steve Browning. I've got a link to the Patreon as well below. And uh, thank you as well to my $10 supporters who will be in the crawl immediately following. Thank you, and I hope this has armed you with knowledge.